So let's move on to uh, one of the newer medical therapies, fostamatinib, which is a sick inhibitor. Um, so can you explain what the sick pathway is, why is it important in the pathogenesis, and how does this drug work? Yeah, so a great question. So fostamatinib just got uh, FDA approved as a newer agent uh, back in uh, May of this of 2018. And uh, what's interesting about this, and I happen to have worked in the laboratory uh, with the sick pathway uh, That's why several I years asked ago, you. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, but so what's interesting about it is that, uh, as uh, Dr. Boucher uh, eloquently explained at the beginning about the mechanism, about the macrophage uh, mediated phagocytosis uh, destroying platelets. So uh, it is under that mechanism has been kind of postulated and understood for decades, basically. And um, as we've understood on a more cellular level what is really happening, intracellular signaling pathways and so forth, uh, it's been found that SIC is one of the key molecules intracellularly that gets activated at least a cytoskeletal change of the macrophage that causes phagocytosis mm -hmm. of any antibody uh, cell complex. Mm -hmm. In this case, an autoantibody binding to a platelet. So the autoantibodies uh, that are formed by whatever stimulus, whether it's idiopathic or whether it's something following an infection, for example, autoantibodies form. The autoantibodies against platelet epitopes. So uh, when the autoantibodies form and they bind to platelets, then the platelet antibody complex will activate macrophages uh, most commonly in the spleen, but it can be any macrophage in the reticular endothelial system. And then uh, when it binds via the FC gamma receptor, uh, across, that's a transmembrane protein on the macrophage uh, cell surface, then the, uh, the, hin the, like the key linchpin inside the macrophage cell is the sick protein, hmm. SYK, or sp spleen tyrosine kinase is the full name of it. And so that is the activated molecule that gets ph phosphorylated, and that causes downstream signaling to occur, which leads to that cytoskeletal change in the protein. So that was the uh, concept behind saying that, well, given that background, if we can somehow inhibit the macrophage phagocytosis step, perhaps we can abrogate the destruction that goes on in the peripheral blood uh, bloodstream. Yeah. Because the autoantibodies may be present in the body, but if the macrophages are not phagocytosing the platelets, yeah. then perhaps we can affect a response. So yeah. that was the, the concept. So it's, uh, I mean, I'm glad uh, you ask also because uh, like any newer mechanism, I think it's good for clinicians to understand. Absolutely. And I think that's why the pathophysiology of the condition, uh, whether you talk about uh, destruction, production issues, it's so crucial in ITP and that remains a big issue is that, well, for this particular patient in front of you, what is the driving mechanism? And we don't have a uh, easy answer, even though I think we'll get to some clues uh, soon. But that's the, that's the biggest thing. So fostamatinib uh, is, is a molecule that is taken orally. Mm -hmm. um, the active metabolite of fostamatinib after it's ingested is the one that binds to the sick molecule inside the macrophage cell. And that causes, uh, it's a uh, inhibition of the downstream signaling, and therefore the phagocytosis doesn't occur. Mm -hmm. It's uh, abrogated by. So it's a truly tar it's a targeted medicine. It's a targeted therapy uh, medicine. It's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, tar uh, oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy that's specifically targeting the sick uh, molecule. And you mentioned it's it's oral. It's once a day. Yeah, twice so the, a day? Cor correct. So the, the, the dosing is twice a day. So the the FDA approved dosing is for 100 milligrams uh, PO twice a day and it can be increased to 150 milligrams POBID if the clinician is not satisfied with the response at the 100 milligram dose. But it's 100 milligrams orally twice a day, and it can be taken with or without food. Oh. Thank you for mentioning that. So Dr. Bechet, I believe you were involved in the um, randomized trials that led to the approval of this drug, FIT1, and, and FIT2 was in Europe, I think. Right, FIT2, and then FIT3, which was the open-label extension study. So we, we, were, we did participate in it. We accrued patients to it. And uh, you know, I, I want to step back just to, to both of your comments just to uh, reiterate that I think it's important for our clinicians out in the community to understand the mechanism of action so that they can realize that with different mechanisms of action, you can switch therapies. Mm -hmm. Because if you, we're going to get to talking about the tipo mimetic agents, and what I see all the time is someone who has tried remiplostim then goes to Eltrombopeg. Well, you know, if they're both tipo mimetic agents, the likelihood of response is very low. So now you have some completely different mechanism Works of action. Works at the level of the macrophages. Right, There's nothing that do, does that so far, except, exactly. I guess, IVIG. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, except it doesn't, it, yeah. 
I guess that's the best way to say it. Say it does. <laughs> I was going to make another comment, but I think I'll hold that for later. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that we, we accrued patients to it. This is a very effective drug. It is twice a day. It's interesting that in the clinical trial, though, 80% of the patients required the higher dose. Mm. So although the approved dose is 100 milligrams twice a day, most patients are going to require, after four weeks of la less than 50,000 platelets, are going to require that higher dose. Hmm. Uh, in the, actually, in the phase one trials, it, the dose went up to 175, but the, it was intolerant. It was a, actually a more effective dose than the 150 is. Uh, so there is some evidence for some dose response there. And the two major side effects that you have to deal with, and if you know this, you can preempt these things and get patients through it is diarrhea, which is the most common. About a quarter of patients will get diarrhea from it. Mm -hmm. So just have Imodium on board, ready to well, go. oncologists should know how to treat diarrhea, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> I, I think that is a reassuring thing that, uh, as I think you'll elaborate on, is that uh, these kind of side effects are in the uh, wheelhouse, so to speak, of most practicing hematologist oncologists. So. And, and the diarrhea, if you manage it for the first several weeks, usually subsides. Oh, okay. So it is a more transient effect than anything else. Um, at least the grade threes that people can get. And grade fours are very uncommon. And then the other is hypertension. And about a quarter of patients, 20% of patients maybe, will get hypertensive. So it's a little bit like the anti-angiogenics. You've got to be ready to deal with that. If you're on an antihypertensive, you may have to adjust it. If you're not on an antihypertensive, you may need to start it. But actually, when they went back and looked at uh, in uh, both, all three of the FIT trials, the median rise in blood pressure was only about five millimeters. Mm. But you have that 15% of patients yeah. where it does go up to a level where you have to make some dose adjustments. Those are the two main things that we saw in the trial. Those are the two main things that you need to deal with and be prepared for. And are there any predictors at all that, that can lead us to choose? Yeah, so in the, in the trial, um, we did regular autoantibody testing. And for the patients, about 60 or 65% of the patients had uh, autoantibodies, and the others did not. And the difference in responses was fairly striking. Hmm. So if you look at the FIT1 and FIT2 trial data, and you remember that these are in patients, this was a, had, had a median of four prior lines of therapy. So this was fifth line therapy. And the, a median number of years of since diagnosis was eight and a half. So a, this is a population that's very different than the population we studied for either remiplostim or altromapig, much further much, down. Yeah, much, much, much more, more refractory. refractory. Yeah, exactly. Which makes sense because before the TPO receptor agonist, there really wasn't anything. So, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So in the in the trials, about twenty to twenty five percent of the patients will have what they call a uh, sustained response. And that sustained response, it was a 24-month trial, and it was patients were seen every two weeks. So in the last half or last 12 weeks, you were seen six times, and you had to have a plate count above 50,000 on at least four of the six visits, and that was called a sustained response. There's also overall response, which was anybody who got a plate count above 50,000 starting from the beginning. But so 20 to 25 percent. If you look now at the population of patients that had autoantibodies, it was 36 percent sustained responses compared to 9 percent in those who did not. Hmm. So it may be a different pathophysiology in that group of patients. It may be more T cell mediated yeah. in those who don't produce the autoantibodies and it's a T cell process that's operant and more autoantibody related in the others. So that may be a clue for both uh, pathophysiology and potentially selecting the right agent for the patient. Yeah, it doesn't seem like a 100% correlation, but at least it's it's something. something there. Yeah, and also that this correlative work is being done to to help identify either clinical predictors or molecular biomarkers because it would be nice to, you know, not arbitrarily select a therapy, but really have a targeted treatment and and know you know what when to select that. So yeah, I'm glad that work's being done. Yeah, I think also uh, just to add to that briefly is that. Um, it, even though uh, I think in practice what winds up happening is that this might help us choose treatments potentially. I still think that it may be, we might need even more robust data to really say that reliably, you know, like the based on TPO levels or based on autoantibody presence, because sometimes assays can vary so much depending on what's oh, sure. available in practice. Yeah, um, and he even said, you know, there, yeah, there were yeah. patients that responded to the drug that did not have the yeah. circulating antibodies. So you this can't. is always one of these uh, tricky things is that, it, well, you know, um, 
uh, is it a yes, no type of thing, or is it like more likely or less likely? So right. it becomes trickier, right, right, but right. I think it's very helpful yeah. that at least it's being looked at these correla uh, correlative studies, so at least we have some indication that, okay, this patient, may maybe it's a T-cell pathway that's a real you know, key driving thing for that patient. So. Yeah.